Just as the horrors of the First World War led to an about-face among progressives who had before supported overseas expansions that conquered other races during the Spanish-American War and later American interventions in Latin America, as well as the historic intervention in the war raging in Europe, so the horrors of the Second World War, and, more specifically, the Holocaust, led to painful reconsiderations of racial beliefs and policies in the Western world. This is not to say that there had been no change in attitudes toward race since the Progressive Era until the Second World War. A coherent school of thought, opposed to the prevailing Progressive Era view of race, emerged in the 1920s under the leadership of anthropologist Franz Boas, a professor at Columbia University, to challenge the Progressive Era orthodoxy. Boas and his followers emphasized environmental explanations of racial and ethnic differences, and apparently this approach made some inroads into the way some intellectuals saw race. Some changes were apparent by the 1930s. As already noted, in 1930, Carl Brigham recanted his earlier views on what the army mental tests implied about the intelligence of men of various ethnicities. As the Jewish population in America, whom Brigham had especially singled out for their low scores on army mental tests during the First World War, became more assimilated and more educated, later mental test studies usually showed them doing far better than on the army tests, and better than the American population as a whole. By the 1930s, the climate of opinion had changed sufficiently that Madison Grant's last book, The Conquest of a Continent, was panned by reviewers and Clashing Tides of Color, by his prize pupil, Lothrop Stoddard, was ridiculed. The Christian Century magazine, for example, said of Grant's book, It gave to prejudice and hatred the false rationalization of an argument having the form, if not the substance, of science. A 1934 survey of opinions among psychologists found 25% still believing that blacks had innately inferior intelligence while 11% believed that blacks had equal intelligence and 64% believed the data to be inconclusive. What had eroded were not only the particular beliefs of the progressive era, but also the dogmatic tone of certainty of the progressives. Otto Kleinberg, one of Boas's disciples who promoted the alternative environmental explanation of mental test differences, did so without the claims of scientific certainty made by progressives when he said, we have no right to conclude that there are no racial differences in mental ability, since it is conceivable that new techniques may someday be developed which will indicate that such differences do exist. Despite these developments in both beliefs and methods, however, it was the Second World War that marked a decisive turning point in American intellectuals' views of race relations. If there is a single book that might be said to mark that turning point in thinking about race among the intelligentsia, it would be An American Dilemma, by Swedish economist Gunnar Myrdal, published in 1944. It was a massive study, more than a thousand pages long, of the many aspects of black-white relations in the United States, and its thesis was that American racial policies, especially in the South, marked a glaring contradiction between the nation's fundamental founding principles of freedom and equality and its actual practices as regards blacks. How to resolve that contradiction was the dilemma posed by Murdahl. By this time, progressives had begun calling themselves liberals, so this now became the prevailing liberal vision as it evolved in the second half of the twentieth century. Broadly speaking, while in the progressive era socioeconomic differences between races were attributed to race, genetics, in the liberal era such differences between races were often attributed to racism. In neither era were alternative explanations taken seriously by much of the intelligentsia. In the liberal era, attributing any part of the differences between blacks and whites in incomes, crime, education, etc., to internal causes, even if social or cultural rather than genetic, was often dismissed as blaming the victim, a phrase preempting the issue rather than debating it. If heredity was the reigning orthodoxy of the progressive era, environment became the reigning orthodoxy of the liberal era. Moreover, Environment usually meant the external contemporary environment, rather than including the internal cultural environment of minorities themselves. If minorities were seen as the problem before, the majority was seen as the problem now.
These premises were stated quite clearly in the introduction to An American Dilemma, where that dilemma was described as a white man's problem, and Merdal added, little if anything could be scientifically explained in terms of the peculiarities of the Negroes themselves. Despite the invocation of science, so reminiscent of the earlier progressive era intellectuals, this was an arbitrary premise which, if followed consistently, would treat black Americans as simply abstract people with darker complexions, who were victims of what Murdahl called confused and contradictory attitudes in the minds of white Americans. Yet Murdahl's own massive study brought out many behavioral and attitudinal differences between blacks and whites, though in the end none of this changed the basic premise of an American dilemma, which remained the central premise of liberal intellectuals for decades thereafter. This premise, that the racial problem was essentially one inside the minds of white people, greatly simplified the task of those among the intelligentsia who did not have to research the many behavioral differences between blacks and whites in America, or the many comparable or larger differences between other groups in other countries around the world that have led to other intergroup complications, frictions, and polarizations which were in many cases at least as great as those between black and white Americans. Nor did intellectuals have to confront the constraints, costs, and dangers inherent in group differences in behavior and values. To the intelligentsia of this later period, racial problems could be reduced to problems inside people's minds, and especially to racism, not only simplifying problems, but enabling intellectuals to assume their familiar stance of being on the side of the angels against the forces of evil, and morally superior to the society in which they lived. Life magazine, for example, greeted publication of An American Dilemma as showing that America was a psychotic case among nations. As with many other such sweeping pronouncements, it was not based on any empirical comparisons. For example, the number of blacks lynched in the entire history of the United States would be a fraction of the Armenians slaughtered by Turkish mobs in one year in the Ottoman Empire, the Igbos slaughtered by Hausa Fulani mobs in one year in Nigeria, not to mention the number of Jews slaughtered by mobs in one year in a number of countries at various times scattered throughout history. While specifically black-white relations in the United States, especially in the South, were more polarized than black-white relations in some other countries, there were even more polarized relations between other groups that were not different in skin color in many other places and times, the Balkans and Rwanda being just two examples in our own times. Gunnar Myrdal's basic premise that racial problems in America were fundamentally problems inside the heads of white people and that the resulting discrimination or neglect explained black-white differences in economic and other outcomes, was to remain the fundamental assumption of liberal thinking and policies for decades thereafter. As Professor Alfred Bloomrosen of Rutgers University, an important figure in the evolution of federal racial policies, put it, discrimination should be broadly defined, for example, by including all conduct which adversely affects minority group employment opportunities. This particular formulation preempts the very possibility that any behavior or performance by minorities themselves plays a role in the economic, educational, and other disparities and gaps which are common among racial or other groups in countries around the world. Such feats of verbal virtuosity were not peculiar to Professor Bloomrosen, but were common among the intelligentsia of the liberal era. Even where there were demonstrable differences in behavior among racial or ethnic groups, whether in crime rates or rates of unwed motherhood, for example, these were more or less automatically attributed to adverse treatment, past or present, by the white majority.